All right, I think we're good. All right. Welcome everyone to Mount Wilson here in the clear skies of Southern California, USA. Um, I understand there are people joining us this evening from all over the continent and all over the world. The response on, to the webinar and to the YouTube live link has been somewhat overwhelming for the small band of intrepid astronomers that are putting on this evening's event. So we're a little nervous that everything's going to work well, a little excited to be here. Um, my name is Dr. Jenny Krestov. I am joined this evening on the catwalk of the 100-inch telescope by Dr. Christopher Burns. You will notice we are not masked. That is because Chris is my husband. We are in the same social bubble. Um, in the 60 inch dome, joining us for observations later this evening is Dr. Jeff Rich and Richard Bell. Bell. Um, you will see that they are wearing masks because they are not in the same bubble. So we are outside of the dome, as you can see right now, it is not yet dark here. The sun set probably around 10 minutes ago. So we have dusk, but it's not quite dark. And Chris is using a Celestron C8 telescope with a um, digital camera that is gonna capture the image of Jupiter and Saturn. Now, usually Jupiter and Saturn are not in the same part of the sky. There's a conjunction every 19.2 years um which means that from our perspective on earth jupiter and saturn seem to line up now of course if you know which planet is closer to the sun and which one is farther from the sun um you will know that jupiter is closer and this finger can be jupiter pretend to be jupiter saturn is farther away and from the top view you'd see them like this but every so often they line up so that they're very close to each other in the sky and that is going to happen tonight now if you've been watching over the last couple of weeks you will have noticed two star-like objects in the southwest getting closer and closer and closer together the brighter of the two is jupiter and that is the one a little bit down and to the right and the one that's a little less bright and a little harder to see that one is saturn but we're going to grab them both in the telescope have you got them in there Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> we so. are going to go and see if we have them in the telescope. So let me change our view perspective. So I'm going to have to switch over to the software. So we are using an ASI camera. And just before we were about to go live, the laptop we were using, of course, had decided to crash. So I'm hoping that I can just get everything back online without too much trouble uh, wow they are they're actually there <laughs> okay so we need to bring the gain down a bit so what i'm doing here is i am playing around with settings on our camera and this is very similar to those of you who do photography the gain is very much like the iso setting on your camera so we're sort of going up and down in the, there we go. Now, of course, we also probably have to focus a little bit. And so bear with me as I, this will, this will just prove to you that we are live. And I do ever so slightly, maybe things are getting better. That might be better. I think yeah. that's better. Yeah, a little bit better. For, oh. Every so often you have like a crisp image. So one of the things with live telescope viewing or with telescope viewing at all from the earth is that you have the atmosphere to contend with. And the atmosphere has a blurring effect on the light that comes through it. So if you imagine looking over a barbecue when you're having barbecue dinner and you see kind of the, the, the haziness um, of objects beyond that heat haze that rises from the barbecue, this is what the atmosphere causes us to see when we look through it. Oops. Now, the closer we are to the horizon, the more atmosphere we actually are looking through. So the worse the effects are. And Jupiter and Saturn 
are pretty close to the horizon, about 20 degrees up from the horizon. Yeah, and that's uh, one of the reasons we're doing this the way we're doing it. We're not using one of the big telescopes on the mountain, unfortunately, because being inside the dome, uh, they have a range of motion that doesn't allow them to go quite as uh, low down as we need them to do. So if this conjunction had happened a little earlier in the season, then we would have shown you this through like the 60 inch or maybe even the 100 inch. But such as it is, we have to put a small telescope, a little eight inch, well, small, it's actually not that small, but <laughs> an eight inch uh, Celestron smith cassegrain telescope. We are on the catwalk outside the dome. Okay, I'm probably gonna go in the wrong direction, but let's see what happens. Oh, I did go, yay. So the telescope we're using, it does have a drive on it. So it does move to counteract the rotation of the earth, but it's not perfectly aligned. We are on a catwalk, so it's not quite the most steady um, surface to put a telescope on. And so you may see a little bit of movement. Um, but when we move the telescope to make sure that we are looking at our intended target, when we move the telescope slowly, that's called slewing which is one of those terms I don't think is used in any other. Um, yeah, we were going to look that up. We'll yeah. It. So another thing that uh, is going on here is because we had to set up on the outside of the dome uh, and we didn't have any stars, in particular, we didn't have the North Star, uh, we had to just do an approximate uh, alignment because of, in order for these telescopes to counteract the mo motion of the uh, Earth, you have to set them up so that they are parallel to the Earth's axis. Uh, for those of you who do uh, ast astronomy uh, outreach or uh, backyard astronomy, you know this is called polar alignment. And we can't see the north, so we kind of had to eyeball it. And luckily, we can just look right inside and there's this really other big telescope behind us that actually is pointing north. So we've got a rough idea of which way to go, but we're, we're entirely surrounded by metal. And so compasses don't work all that well in this situation. Um, but I think it's, it's doing pretty well. So the questions, I, I'm seeing questions coming through um, the Q&A with participants. And the question is, which planet is which? The one on the left of the screen, which is a little bit higher up and a little bit closer to the edge, that one is Saturn. And the rings are somewhat vertical. So you should be able to pick out the rings. The larger of the two blobs, hopefully that you're seeing, is Jupiter. And just above and below Jupiter, those are some of the moons. Now, Jupiter has four huge moons, um, and you may have heard of them, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Those are the four that are easily vi visible with the backyard telescopes, telescope, or if you have really good dark skies and a great pair of binoculars. You can see the Galilean moons with the, those four giant moons with binoculars. These were- Whoa, sorry, that, we saw a really nice meteor go past. Wow, <laughs> that was unexpected and very bright. This so, so evening sorry. is awesome. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> the four Galilean moons were easily are easily visible. Galileo, Galileo saw them back when he first looked at the night sky with a telescope in the early 1600s, 1610. Um, they are called the Galilean moons in his honor. I think at last count, Jupiter is known to have 78 moons, but that count keeps going up as smaller and smaller objects are found to be orbiting the planet farther and farther out. And often when a spacecraft goes past Jupiter, it will discover some more moons. Um, so we have these two telescope or these two planets in the same view. Um, so something else we can do. Sorry, I, we, you'll mean, you may notice that these planets dance around a little bit every now and then. It's whenever I take a step too close to the telescope. We're in a bit of a rickety situation. So we'll try not to move around too much so that you uh, don't get a bad view. Uh, but what we can do is we can zoom in on each one of these guys and have a closer look. So I'm gonna try doing that. That uh, means I'm going to move over to here. Um, where is it? Oh, there it is. Oh, 
Oh, interesting. We've got two. We've got two versions of this running. Hopefully, this doesn't cause problems. All right. Let us know if we are. Are we zooming in? Let me check this chat. Uh, no, we are not. Okay, so I got to go back to the other one. <laughs> this is confusing. So bear with us. We only have one screen and about five different applications running. All right, so I should be able to. Maybe it's doing the same thing in both. And now, there we go. There, so hopefully you should get a better view of Saturn now. And we'll try to stand steady and not move. Oh, that did it. Okay, it's gonna let it settle down for a minute. Okay, and as you can see, these planets are kind of not quite staying in the same place. And again, this is because the tracking on the telescope isn't perfect for tonight. Now, I'm gonna try bringing the gain up a little bit and see if we can see any of the moons around Saturn. There we go. Now you can clearly see a moon around Jupiter on one side. And we have probably, I guess, one moon very close to Saturn, actually maybe two, one to the upper left and one to the lower right. The view of these will get better as the background sky gets darker. Yeah, I can also go have a better look at Jupiter over here. There we go. So hopefully Jenny can tell me what the order of these moons is. Do we have the our cheat sheet? It's on my screen somewhere, but I only have well, while she's doing that, there's also a star that you can just see to the left. And that might be the same star that was very close to one of these moons just last night, I think. And let's see if I can find the other. So Jupiter has four moons that you can see with a telescope, backyard telescope. Uh, I'm going to probably have to move the telescope a little bit because they're coming out of view. So let's do this. Uh, okay. All right. And for some reason it doesn't want to stop. Okay, I am going to have to pause for a moment. And Okay, someone's on their way down. We're doing a live show. I'm sorry. Okay. Oops, too far. Okay, I think we got the, the other moon. As you can see, it's way far off uh, in the other direction. I'm trying to get this guy centered. I think we might be getting to the edge of where the telescope is happy tracking. We're getting very low on the horizon.
Oop, damn. Okay, so uh, the other thing I'm going to try and do once I can get the telescope to point in the right direction is bring the gain down and that will hopefully allow us to see the surface features of Jupiter a bit better. Okay, so the far one out was? Callisto. Callisto, oh, but the it's- The one right at the bottom. Okay, so the one on the other side is Io? That's Europa. Europa, okay, so the, yep. so the moon on the By top itself. is Europa. Next down is? Well, Ganymede is tucked in very close to Jupiter. And I'm not seeing it here. Okay, maybe that. So that must have just been a, a star that just happened to be in the same direction. Okay, why well, it does not want to track in one direction? Oh, hold on. Oh, wrong way. Okay, I think I got it sussed out here. There we go. Okay, that's the right direction. All right, now I'm going to try playing around with the gain a bit. So we can see Europa in there. Or no, Ganymede. So Ganymede is within a diameter's distance. So if you look at Jupiter and look at the diameter, Ganymede is um, Oops, that was too far. Within that diameter's distance, uh, just below Jupiter as seen on the screen. So it's really quite, quite close. All right, I guess I went too far in the gain. So let's bring the gain back up a bit. It's starting to see features. It's hmm. amazing that it's hiding so well being the largest moon in the solar system. It's larger than Mercury has its own magnetic field. I guess a moon-wide magnetic field. A weak one, but- Okay, there we go. Now we're starting to see features. Oh yeah, you can see the- the I'll zoom in the a straight. bit. Okay, a bit more. Well, I think we have a really good seeing tonight because we're dipping very low in the horizon and the fact that we can actually see the structures on the surface of the planet is pretty remarkable. And one of the things you can do, and we won't be able to do it tonight, unfortunately, but uh, we've often taken this camera and you can now take a movie and just take frame after frame after frame after frame. And you may notice every once in a while, the, the, the image becomes a little more crisp than it was before. And that's because we have this turbulent atmosphere above us. And every now and then you get a nice little spot through a bit of clear air, which gets you to see a nice image. And if you've got, you know, thousands of these frames, then you can run some software that goes through each one, tries to figure out which one's the best, and then keeps only those ones. And then you stack them all out together to get a nice image of the planet. Uh, not too long ago, Blake Estes, who uh, was a... Uh, I think he was a super uh, assistant superintendent here. He did this with Mars and came up with some amazing views of Mars. We'll see Mars later on tonight from the 60 inch. Um, but if you get a chance, go to the Mount Wilson website or Facebook page and look up his pictures of Mars. They are really quite amazing. Okay, so let's go and see if we can find Saturn again. I'm probably gonna have to bring the gain up again just because Saturn is a little on the dim side compared to Jupiter. So slowing down Jupiter. Yeah, so that's one of the things about these cameras. The hum <laughs> oop, oh no, I don't want to do that. No. No, do not do that. Okay. All right, let's go over there. And I think I'm gonna to need to move the telescope again. We're not tracking quite as well as we could. So let's go. Do I remember which way I went? <laughs> let's take a guess. Yes, okay. Get a little closer to the center. Okay, and now we will zoom in. Oh, again with that. No. 
Okay. And I was hoping maybe if the seeing improves, if we get a nice little view, you might see a split in the rings, but we might not have the kind of skies we need to do that. We routinely are able to see, you know, a gap in the rings of Saturn when we're looking through the 60 inch on a, you know, relatively good night. Uh, but right now we're just really close to the horizon and things are getting kind of, <laughs> so you can see from frame to frame uh, how the atmosphere is kind of distorting the image. And this is why we really like going to space because then you get above all this and you're able to see things much more pristinely. You don't have to look like you're looking through the bottom of a, if you've ever looked at the bottom of a pool and how everything kind of shimmers through the water. It's exactly the sort of same sort of thing that's going on here. All right, go ahead and zoom out just a little bit. I think I can just barely see a shadow cast by the planet on the ring. You may notice that the ring doesn't seem to go all the way around. That's because it's going behind and there's a shadow cast by the planet on the ring. You also may notice a sort of a blue tinge and a red tinge across. So blue at the bottom and red at the top. And the reason for that is because the atmosphere is acting like a prism. So this is called atmospheric refraction. The Earth's atmosphere. Yes, the Earth's atmosphere. Thank you. So when you say bottom, and the blue is on the bottom, is that to the left or to the right of this image? Uh, I would say to the bottom of the image. Well, to the lower left and right. is the bluer part and the upper right is kind of like the redder part. I don't know if that's going to come through on our remote uh, connections because, you know, we're seeing this at the best resolution, but when we transmit this information down from the mountain across the internet over the world, you're going to get video compression. So I'm hoping you guys see something as nice as we do. That was a good one right there. Um, but if not, and unfortunately, we can't see any of the moons. Yeah. Oh, yes. Let's let's bring the gain up again and we see if we can find some moons. I'm going to zoom out a little bit. Punch this up. Yep, I'm seeing the moons of, of Jupiter easily, but not Saturn. Okay, so we're at full gain, so we're going to bring the, maybe bring the exposure up a little bit as well. Okay, we need to go to the next level. Exposures, oops, that might be too much. Oh, no, okay. So what I'm doing now, instead of playing with the gain or the ISO, I'm playing with the exposure, which is the shutter speed. And I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but definitely seeing a moon over here by Jupiter. That's uh, Saturn, my mistake. Oh. Let's bring up the exposure All right, bit. so why we're not seeing Ganymede? Because I'm thinking to myself, my goodness, we really should be seeing Ganymede. It is the largest, it is reflecting. Um, lots of sunlight back to us. Yeah, it's right in front of Jupiter tonight, right now. Oh. Give it a couple of hours, it will move off. Um, so I think the map that we had that placed the moons of Jupiter that I was looking at was either a few hours ago or a few hours from now. But I'm looking, I'm using a piece of software that I got my for my phone called Sky Safari. There's also, also Sky View, Skywalk, many different apps you can get for your phone that will help you visualize the night sky. And Ganymede is right on top of one of those darker bands. So you know what so, I think we should do now is we should probably take questions. The problem is we can't look at, <laughs> we can't see the questions being asked because we have to control the telescope at the same time. But if we take a pause right here, let's see if we uh, have like some top questions that our moderators can throw our way. So do you want to try to uh, look in the chat? Oh, there's the chat. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay, there's a question. What size eyepiece is that Celestron C8 using? Well, we're actually not using an eyepiece at all. We are putting a, what's called a CMOS camera. So there's different kinds of sensors you can use. So a lot of um, uh, DLSR cameras use CMOS chips. And, uh, oh, we're gonna, you want to go to the PowerPoint? Because I can show them the rig that oh, we have. That's right. We can show the rig. OK. Uh, I, I thought this. about this inevitability. I took pictures of our setup. 
Okay. So and I'm going to there you go. go through our PowerPoint. Um, I didn't do this at the very beginning. I probably should. Uh, tonight's event is brought to you by three institutions, the observatories of the Carnegie Institution um, for Science, the Mount Wilson Institute, and Glendale Community College. As I said at the very beginning, my name is um, Dr. Jenny Krestov. I'm a professor of astronomy and physics and the planetarium director at GCC, which is a local community college here in Southern California, and the closest one to Mount Wilson, physically. Um, Chris Burns beside me is an astronomer at the uh, Carnegie Observatories and my husband. I am gonna flip through this lovely PowerPoint that I had put together to get to the very end slides, which are the slides that show the camera that we're using and the telescope and kind of how the rig is set up. But I will move through them somewhat slowly. This is an iconic picture of the two largest telescopes here on Mount Wilson. We are at the 100 inch right now. Um, George Ellery Hale was the founder of the Mount Wilson Observatory, map of our area. He and um, our, uh, Andrew Carnegie um, built this facility. Um, Carnegie funded it back over 100 years ago. Um, there's the Carnegie Observatories in downtown Pasadena, GCC, and my planetarium over there on the left. Um, but we want to get to the end pictures. Um, if you didn't know, there was a wildfire that came very close to. Um, you went all the way at the end. Oh, and they're not on my. They're not on this one. They're they're on the other computer. Oh, okay. Oh, nuts! We don't have the pictures. I'll get them up for you. I promise. Um, for those of you who heard about the Bobcat fire, the perimeter came extraordinarily close to Mount Wilson. It was through the absolutely heroic efforts of the firefighters here in Southern California. Um, you can see kind of a superimposed image here of a satellite screenshot of the observatories and how close that fire actually got to um, the, the actual domes. Um, I was teaching an astronomy lab one night and I, I knew the Bobcat fire was getting closer to Mount Wilson and I went to the webcam on the 150 inch solar telescope tower. And this is what I saw on the webcam. And I honestly had to end class. I was so distraught, but it was a backfire that the genius firefighters had set that saved this facility. But um, yeah, let's go back over to what we're looking at because the images are not up on this. Okay on this one uh, it's back here oop i gotta do a little centering i think yep okay all right so wait, can you check the in there and see if you can see the, the chat yep questions are look good i see what you see all right were they getting any questions on the chat Okay, I'm going to bring the gain down just so we have a better image of this. Okay. Okay, so I have this, which shows us the chat questions. Hmm? Oops. So one of the questions is, let's, let's have a look at the conjunction again. Yeah, um, <laughs> we're, we're, we're getting there. Uh, maybe a bit more again. It's unfortunate that we cannot see both the details of Jupiter and Saturn at the same time. We need to bring up the gain enough to see Saturn. Okay. So there was a good question about the orientation of the rotation of Jupiter's moons from this perspective. So they um, are all lined up and that line that we see of the moons of Jupiter is the, uh, the line of their orbital plane. So they will orbit around on the same plane that you see them lined up. 
if that makes sense. Yeah, so from our perspective, if we were to watch this oops, over uh, many hours, uh, what we would see is these planets would more, sorry, the moons, I should say, would go up and down in this view that we have. Okay, well, at least there, I think we can see the rings. Try and bring these a little bit closer into the center. Now we're looking out here. It's getting dark. It is getting dark. Okay. And let's let's just I'll stop breathing for a minute so this thing can settle down. So one of the questions was why they look so far apart in the telescope view. Oh, okay. Uh, so that, that's a really interesting question because um, if you're if you were an amateur astronomer looking at this, you're probably thinking to myself, "Oh my goodness, they're so close." Um, I have never seen two planets together uh, in the same field of view in a telescope. So this is actually a first for me. So they are very close. Now, why are they not even closer? Uh, the reason for that is you can think of Saturn and Jupiter as being kind of like the hands on a clock. And Jupiter's on the inside, it goes around faster. Okay, well, that's the opposite of a clock, but... Uh, Jupiter goes around the sun more quickly. Saturn takes a little bit more time to go around. But if you can picture that idea of a clock, you know that every now and then the two hour hands line up. Or the two hands, yeah. The two hands line up. And that's the same here. You can think of these as hands on a clock. Every 20-ish years, uh, Jupiter and Saturn are lined up, at least as far as we can see from the Earth. The problem is this clock is not perfect and the orbits of these planets are tilted. So even when they're close together in their orbits, in when you're looking down on the solar system, if you were to look at the edge of the solar system, you would probably see that one planet is above and one planet is below. And this is precisely the same reason we don't get solar eclipses every month because the moon as it goes around the earth is not on a orbital plane that's perfectly aligned with our orbit around the sun. So you get these misalignments. Uh, so I think if I'm, mis I'm trying to remember, but last time this happened uh, was in 16, oh gosh, I left my notes down there, uh, the 1600s. Uh, the problem with that was that lineup happened very close to the sun from our perspective. And so by the time the sun set, you wouldn't be able to see these planets. They would have set pretty much already. Uh, so we have to go all the way back to 1226, I believe, when the planets were this close. And I think in that case, they were even closer. Uh, I don't remember exactly how far apart they were at the time. Um, now, I also saw an article. Now, I don't know how, how real this is, but it was claimed that something in 9000 BC, there was a conjunction where the planets were right on top of each other. Um, maybe. Uh, I have a feeling that it's hard to go back in time quite that far because these planets get sort of wobbled around a little bit. Their, they, their gravity interacts with each other. Their orbits change a little bit over time. So I don't know how precise that is, but it does give you an idea how rare it is to get two planets right on top of each other because not only do they have to be in the right place at the right time, the orbits have to line up just about perfectly and the earth has to be in the right place. So. A lot of things have to happen at the same time for us to see one of these. So if I'm remembering correctly, if you hold your pinky finger, if everyone puts their arm up and stretches their arm out, and holds their pinky finger up, whatever's blocked behind your pinky finger, that's two degrees of view. So when you are trying to measure things in the sky, we can't use like inches or miles or kilometers or whatever because it doesn't work. Things that are farther, you know, and things that are closer, you have to have some other way of measuring the sky. So we use degrees. And of course, there are 360 degrees in a circle. From horizon to horizon, that's half a circle, 180. And if you stretch your pinky finger out as far as it'll go, as far as your arm can reach, your pinky finger will block out two degrees 
of field, it's called, your field of view. Jupiter and Saturn now are 0.1 of a degree apart from each other. So your pinky finger can cover this conjunction. In fact, if you're looking at your screen now, your pinky finger would be 20 times bigger than the distance from Jupiter to Saturn. So if that gives you a sense, I mean, there are people who are saying, oh my gosh, they're so far apart. But, you know, as Chris said, the astronomers in the crowd are like, holy cow, they're so close together. Um, I am looking up at the night sky in the same direction that the telescope is pointed, obviously. And I can see Jupiter. And I think Saturn's up there as well. Saturn is not quite as bright as is obvious on the screen, but my eyes cannot resolve those two objects separately. So I don't have great eyesight. I wear glasses. Um, but can you see Saturn from Bare, Jupiter? Bar barely without my glasses. I can just barely see it. Maybe we should show folks what we're actually looking at on the, okay. on the camera before it gets too right. dark. So we're going to show you what we're seeing on the sky before it gets just too dark to see anything. All right, um, so we're gonna do you want to tell that we're going over um, to the... Yeah, so if we 60 could... Inch. 60 inch. Sorry, 100 inch. 100 okay. inch. If we could spotlight the 100 inch uh, iPad. Mm -hmm. Have you got that one on mute? Oh, yeah, good point. Let me do that now. So welcome to the... So welcome to the 100 inch dome. <laughs> Okay. You're good. okay, welcome to the 100 inch dome. Um, this is the iconic telescope, which we are not using. Um, but we have a much smaller telescope set up on the catwalk. So let me just turn the camera around. And this is the door. And I can't go outside because I lose the Wi Fi signal. So you're only going to see it from here. Chris, do you have a, um, oh. a light to light up the telescope? I will try to light up the telescope. So you can see our setup out here. And let me see if my green laser pointer is actually visible here. I don't know if you can see that. The beam? Yeah, I think you can see it. Well, we can see it here. I don't know if they'll be able to see it out there, but. Well, you do it again and I will sit over here. Oh yeah, I think I can see it. So you guys can probably see this tree that my green laser pointer is pointing at. And right above that, that is where the conjunction is. Okay, I'll turn the light on so you can see what you're doing here. All right, but there's our telescope there um, that you can barely see. Let me get my green light right there. Um, and the question that came through is, why are we not using this fabulous telescope? Unfortunately, the fabulous telescope cannot point down close enough to the horizon to image the conjunction. If the conjunction were higher in the sky, you better believe we'd be using this, but we can't because it just can't go that low. But this is, for those of you who've never been in here before, it is, oh, it just smells like astronomy. I mean... You know, we have so many famous astronomers who've worked on this equipment. Edwin Hubble, Harlow Shapley, George Ellery Hale himself, Milton Humason. Um, it's a beautiful facility. It is over 100 years old now. Um, and we have both old and new equipment. I love this table. We have one old phone, two old phones, three old phones, and then we have the modern one. But I'm gonna let Chris take it away, head back to the conjunction, because that is the star of this evening. So Chris, if you wanna head back to the conjunction. I am gonna go.
Okay. So I did my, okay. So we're still there. Uh, let me try and get this a bit better centered. Um, did we, I guess uh, there was one question we had before, what, which eyepieces we were using and we were not really using an eyepiece. Uh, what we're doing is we're having a sensor that goes in the place of where the eyepiece normally would be. And so what you're seeing is essentially the natural magnification of the telescope. The primary mirror, which is concave shaped, uh, reflects the light up to a secondary, then reflects back to the back side of the telescope. I don't know if you guys, you guys were able to see that when we were kind of trying to show it to you. And then that goes right into the sensor and we bring it to focus on the surface of the CMOS camera. Uh, and the CMOS is a color camera. And we use this rather than a CCD, mostly because we can do very fast exposures, uh, update them rapidly. We're trying to give you something like the uh, experience that you would have if you had your eyeballs up here with us at the telescope. Unfortunately, the camera, as you can see, it has a hard time being able to show you both bright and dim things at the same time. The human eye is actually much better for this. Uh, you'd be able to see Saturn and Jupiter much better if you had your eyes in an eyepiece. But since we can't have you up here, that we do the best we can. Um, so we're supposed to go to the moon at some point. You know what? Can we do one thing before sure. we head over to the moon? Um, Ganymede is supposed to be right in front of Jupiter. And if we turn the game oh, way down, okay. it should be a bright spot on the dark band. Ooh. Okay, we'll try. I, I have a feeling the scene. This is a challenge. I have a, I have a feeling the scene. We're up for a challenge, us, but we'll try it. I'm also having a look at the chat um, and the questions that are there. And one of the questions was, would this conjunction be observable from the International Space Station? Ooh. Yes, absolutely. So the International Space Station orbits the Earth um, at a distance of about 300 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. So we are seeing this conjunction from the West Coast of North America, from the East Coast of North America, from Brazil, from the UK, anywhere on the Earth, because the Earth is so far away from both Jupiter and Saturn, we get to see pretty much the same view. The International Space Station is further from the core of the Earth, but the International Space Station, if it was right above Mount Wilson, would be closer to Mount Wilson than New York City certainly would be, and probably in San Francisco would be. So you would be able to see the same view. To put it kind of into context, if you imagine a grain of sand, and if you were on one side of the grain of sand versus the other side of the grain of sand, would New York City, if the grain of sand happened to be in California, would New York City look pretty much the same from either side of the grain of sand? Well, in this case, the grain of sand is Jupiter, or is the Earth, and Jupiter and Saturn are so far away that it really doesn't matter what side of the Earth you're on. The view is the same. I, I I'm not, not seeing, seeing it. it. <laughs> no, even using inverted vision, I'm not seeing this one here. Yeah. That's a joke, by the way, for those of you who know about inverted vision. It doesn't work with a screen. So, okay. Um, so in the program tonight, we've actually gone a little bit long with this as we anticipated. Um, the next thing we we're going to do is go and have a look at the moon and then switch over to the 60 inch. However, we do plan to come back and look at the conjunction between objects at the 60 inch so that if people come late, they'll still be able to see it. And we'll try showing it to you for as long as we can see it from here, which is probably going to be a good long time. So, um, probably, probably, uh, you know, at this point, let's see, I think maybe it might just better just go right to the 60 inch for the moon. What do you think? No, let's do this and we'll All show right. them a view through the eight inch telescope. And then when they get to the 60 inch, okay. the difference will be amazing. All right, here we go. You get to keep talking while I do this. <laughs> All right, so while Chris is slewing our telescope over to um, the moon, I will let you guys know that the moon is high in the sky here as seen in Southern California. If you're on the West Coast of North America, you'll be able to see the moon pretty high up wherever you are on the world. Um, it is a first quarter moon tonight. So the, from my perspective, the right-hand side is illuminated 
and the left hand side is not. Now, one of the things that I always find quite comical is often in movies and in wow, whoa, okay, a little too bright. <laughs> we got the moon. So you probably always got to, oh, we got to zoom out too. That will help. Well, okay, that's pretty good. Uh, let's bring the game. Down. I love this camera. Wow, that was faster than expected. The telescope was, oh, you didn't slew. I you didn't. just took I the just, clutch just, off and just, just moved it. It's like, okay, so there we go. The moon. <sighs> so there's the man in the moon. Or there's uh, Mare Tranquilitatis, that one. And so that's where Apollo 11 landed. I don't know if you can see that. Can can they see this cursor? I'll go check. Yeah, I'll go check. I think Apollo 11 landed right about there. Yeah, you can see the wow, look at these craters. Yeah, it really helps when you've got that. Oh, see, you walked onto the catwalk. Sorry. <laughs> Don't breathe. My bad. But it just the clarity. This is stunning. And these are live views, people. This is not photograph we've taken earlier. This is live streamed straight from the telescope into your living rooms your sitting rooms, your kitchen tables, wherever you happen to be right now. Um, that's beautiful. All of these, you walked across the catwalk again. Sorry. <laughs> Every time the moon looks like it's heading off in a different direction, that's probably because Chris has been walking across the catwalk. Um, all of these circular uh, depressions here, these are craters. And they would have been made when some sort of space rock, larger or smaller, randomly hit the moon over the 4.65 billion years almost that the moon has been orbiting the sun along with the earth. Um, it has been hit a number of times. So has earth for that matter. Um, the biggest collisions were at uh, really the beginning of the solar system, the first billion, billion and a half years. That was an era of heavy bombardment. One very large craters like this one here would have formed this one over here is Mare Tranquilitatis, which is the Sea of Tranquility, which is where Apollo 11 first landed, I believe, down in this section here. And you'll notice the Mare, which is Latin for sea, as in ocean. Um, Galileo, when he first looked at the moon with his telescope, he thought they were oceans. So he lived in Italy. He didn't live far from the ocean, and the ocean looks very dark um, sometimes. And he saw these very smooth areas and thought maybe they were filled with water. They weren't. Um, but what you are seeing when you look at this darker area is ancient lava floodplains. So inevitably a huge um, rock, space rock and asteroid would have impacted the early moon and cracked the crust. And then magma from underneath would have oozed up through that crack and flooded the bottom of the crater. Now the moon we believe is solid pretty much all the way through now. It has cooled since it formed almost four and a half billion years ago, or just a little more than that. Um, but we have beautiful image of the moon, which is going out of the field of view. So let me try not to step too hard on things I'm gonna grab the control the paddle and see oh a little too far so they're ready over there all right oh you've lost it oh have i lost it i've it's lost gone. the moon well that is a great time to say that was our view of the moon with the eight inch telescope right now we are going to change video feeds to head over to the 60 inch dome um jeff and richard are going to take it away and show you the moon with the 60 inch telescope so off you go howdy <laughs> hi everyone can you hear me we're over at the 60 inch telescope uh looking at a close-up view of the moon um we have absolutely beautiful seeing tonight uh we've been we've been getting the telescope ready while you've been looking at the conjunction and the view you have through the 60 inch, this is a much bigger mirror uh, and it's a much, much uh, more zoomed in view. We're looking at just a, 
few craters on the edge of the Sea of Tranquility. Um, I can't tell you exactly where because we've been looking at moon maps and trying to figure it out this whole time. Sea of Serenity. Okay, so we think we're near the Sea of Serenity. I take it back. I'm still looking for the exact location, uh, but turns out as, uh, as, as we just heard, there are loads of craters on the moon. Uh, so, um, but you'll notice like, you'll notice right away, um, the, the view is much more zoomed in. And the great thing about the 60 inch, because the mirror is so much bigger, it allows us to zoom in much more because we're collecting so much more light. Uh, and another thing you might notice as you watch the image, it's updating live. So the camera, there's a camera attached to the 60 inch telescope uh, and it's taking pictures uh, every a fraction of a second. So it's, it's taking sort of a live video feed. And as the atmosphere between us and the moon uh, wobbles around, it, it causes the image to warp just a little bit. Um, but just the same, it looks really good, at least, at least on my end. Um, and just so you can have an idea what, uh, what we're actually looking through, I'm gonna show you what the dome looks like for just a second. Um, so this is us in the 60 inch dome. Hi everyone, I'm the guy sitting at the computer. This is Richard over here operating the telescope. And we have a, a, a docent tonight on hand, Tim Thompson, who's an expert at, uh, at Mount Wilson history and, and everything else. But uh, I wanted you to see what we're looking through. You can see the 60 inch telescope. It's, it's uh, not as big as the 100 inch, but it's a spectacular telescope uh, and much bigger than the eight inch telescope with the beautiful view that we saw before. Uh, and the camera that we're looking through is attached to the side of the telescope uh, where we would normally put an eyepiece. You could actually look with your eye. Um, so Richard is climbing up the ladder. If you can see the, the camera that is looking at the moon is right there. So I'm going to show you again. This is what you would see if you were looking through the telescope with your eyes, pretty much, pretty much. Um, and the great thing is uh, you can do that with the 60 inch uh, sometime in the future, you, get, you, you can get a chance to actually look through this telescope. It's, it's one of the biggest, it's pretty much the biggest telescope I've ever gotten to look through with the naked eye. Um, so, uh, I'm looking for more questions. So, uh, if, if uh, the, the other great thing about the, the 60 inch is, um, because we have this much more zoomed in view, um, you can actually, it feels like you're standing on the moon. Do, do you mind slewing just a little bit, just to just slew a little bit so we can see how that looks? So, uh, yeah. So if you really want a close up view of the moon, this is the place to come. Um, and tonight, uh, if you're, uh, as, as you heard already, the moon is a first quarter. It's actually a really good time to look at the moon with the telescope because there's a lot more contrast. Uh, the full moon, um, because, this, because it's so, so bright and there's not very many shadows because of how the moon and the sun are lined up, um, it's actually much more spectacular to look at the moon with a telescope or a pair of binoculars at a time around first quarter when there's these beautiful shadows, you can see them coming in at the upper, edge of, upper right edge of these craters, uh, even though you don't get to see the whole moon. And for those of you, again, naked eye, uh, tonight, uh, if you were to go outside right now, if you happen to be lucky and can see the sky, you could still see the conjunction Jupiter and Saturn very low in the sky now. Uh, very, very bright. It looks like a really bright star with a slightly less bright uh, star right next to it. Then um, further to the south, so if you're looking at Jupiter and Saturn and then you go a little bit to the left and up, you'll see the first quarter moon. Uh, and then if you go a little bit up and left again, you might see a very, very bright red star. Uh, that very bright red star is actually the planet Mars. Um, so there's three planets in the sky that you can see with just your naked eye right now, which is really great. Uh, and if you happen to have a telescope, you can take a closer look as we were doing with Jupiter and, and Saturn earlier. Um, let's see. That's a good question. How many mirrors does this telescope have? So. Uh, this is pretty much the first big reflecting telescope. Uh, the, the mirror is actually right next to Richard there. Would you mind pointing, pointing it out for folks who are on the feed? So the mirror is at the bottom of the telescope. What you see is a whole bunch of weights that balance the telescope. On the other side of that is a big 60 inch piece of glass that's coated with aluminum to reflect light. And then all the way at the, that is what collects the light first. The light coming from the moon is bouncing off of that first mirror 
then bouncing up to a second mirror at the very top of the telescope that in my video feed is off in the darkness there, which is okay. We have to be dark enough to see the moon. Uh, then that light bounces back down to a third mirror that's angled to direct the light out the side of the telescope right to our camera there. So this telescope actually uses three mirrors. Um, the telescope that Chris is using, uh, Chris uh, is, uh, only has two mirrors. There's a primary mirror that bounces the light up to the second mirror, just like this one, but there's actually a tiny hole in the primary mirror so the light can escape out the bottom of the telescope. Let's go back to the beautiful view of the moon because I can't get enough of it. Uh, so now that you've had a good look at the moon, I think uh, uh, is, the, is the Celestron back on the conjunction? Can we still see it? Unfortunately, the 60 inch has the same problem as the 100 inch. We can't get low enough in the sky to see Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, but can, uh, can I hear from Chris and Jenny? Are you, are you all there? Oh, sure. While we're waiting, we'll go ahead and take a different look at a different part of the moon. We were just excited to see the moon tonight because it's a really good, uh, really good quality images tonight. There's the South Pole of the moon. Great. There's the Terminator, the dividing line between the okay. day and night side. Ah, I hear Chris. I think folks are really excited to see the conjunction until we can't okay. possibly see it anymore. So All right. I think we're back. Yeah. Excellent. Yep, there we go. All right. So we have more questions to answer. Ooh, look at all the questions. Uh, Oh my gosh. Oh, can you donate to the stream? I don't think so, <laughs> but thank you for asking. That's great. Uh, you can donate at Mount Wilson's website. So mtwilson.edu, you can donate there. And uh, carnegiescience.edu also has a way for you to donate. If you wish to, does, Car does Glendale have? As does Glendale Community College. We have a very strong foundation that would love to take donations. Um, one thing to keep in mind, Mount Wilson did have that almost disastrous bobcat fires. So Mount Wilson is absolutely in need of donations. So um, that would be a great place to go if you feel the urge. Um, we are back on the conjunction. We've got Saturn and Jupiter in the field again. Um, okay, we have a question is, how many times does this happen in 60 years? Well, three. Yeah, sort of. I mean, um, it depends on what you mean by this. Uh, three times Jupiter and Saturn will pass each other in the sky, but it won't be for a while yet. I think it's another 80 years before you get something as close as this. And we, when I say as close as this, what I really mean is within the same field of view of a telescope, I think is... I think that's on what they mean by wide, this. On a very wide field of view well, very, telescope. Yeah, so it depends on the telescope, you know. Um, and that has to do with the fact um, that the orbits are aligned differently as they orbit, as the planets orbit the sun, the orbits are, they're not rolling on the same, they're not like marbles rolling on the same table. They're on, you know, one's rolling on a slightly inclined table, if you would. Um, so they don't align as closely as we're seeing tonight. Um, they will come probably within a, a number of degrees of each other. That's like single digit degrees of each other, but they wouldn't um, come as closely. Okay, I was looking for more. Oh, can you see Neil Armstrong's footprints? I <laughs> wish. <laughs> so um, the diameter of the moon is one quarter the diameter of the earth. So we're talking about 3000 kilometers across. Um, when you saw the moon, the first image you saw of the moon with the eight inch telescope, we were looking easily at half the moon. So that's going to be 1500, a thousand miles across, 1500 K kilometers across. So, you know, no, 
because the footprint is very small compared to a thousand miles. Um, I know there are some orbiting, so there are some uh, satellites orbiting the moon and they have imaged the lander pad, but not the footprints. Because, guys, I mean, spacesuits are big, but they're still human sized footprints. So um, that wouldn't be uh, anything that would be possible. I'm looking at more, trying to get uh, more of the questions. Ooh, that's a good question. How long until they converge? Uh, they already did. The, oh, their closest yeah. approach, I believe, was at 3 p.m. Pacific, 3.30 p.m. Pacific, 1.30 p.m. Eastern. So as we watch, they are moving away from each other ever so slowly. So night after night after night, you're going to see them just uh, drift apart. Largely because Jupiter orbits more quickly than Saturn does. Jupiter physically moves faster than Saturn does. And it will be kind of, if you imagine um, people running on a track or cars driving in circles, the innermost car is, has a shorter path and can go faster. Um, so Jupiter is going to be, I guess, pulling away from Saturn from our perspective. Oh, here's an easy one. If the moon collides with us, will we survive? No. No. <laughs> Next question. Uh, why does Saturn have rings? Uh, probably what happened. It's, it's actually that kind is of, a really good question. Oh, kind of related. So um, as a moon gets closer to a planet, a big planet like Saturn or Jupiter, uh, there's this thing called tidal forces. And all that is, is one side of the moon being closer to the planet than the other side feels a bigger pull uh, from gravity. And this gets worse and worse. The difference between them gets worse and worse as it gets closer to the uh, planet. So if a moon strays just a little too close to its parent planet, those tidal forces can rip the moon apart. And then that could spread out into a debris disk, just like we see around Saturn. So it's quite likely that Saturn is not going to keep this ring forever. Um, I'm not a planetary scientist, so I don't know exactly what the time scales are, but we can consider ourselves relatively lucky that we were able to see Saturn's rings. Yeah, there time. is there is some theories that suggest that the rings are only around 65 million years old. All right, I'm going which to... Which is quite young in Saturn's, you know, existence. I would just um, be here a bit. The... Rings of Saturn are made of ice particles, so water ice. And ice, if you think of a big chunk of ice, it's pretty hard. But if you pull at it or hit it, it shatters, right? Because it's it it's crystalline form. So if you take, you have a chunk of ice and then you hit it with a hammer, it will shatter into little pieces. I'm not saying that that's exactly what happened to Saturn's rings or how Saturn's rings formed, but if there is um, a moon that comes too close, it can be pulled apart. And because the rings are made of particles of water ice, billions of particles of water ice, um, it is not surprising. Structurally, water is pretty brittle and can be pulled apart and would break into tiny pieces as we're seeing. Okay, I'm going to bring up the gain so we can have a look at the moons again. All right. But I think the telescope's having more and more trouble. So I can way. tell you that the one above the view we are having now, um, you will see three moons orbiting the bright blob, which is Jupiter, on the right-hand side. Um, the one at the top is um, Europa. And the one, and then there are two below. The closer one into the planet is going to be Io. And then the farthest most one out is Callisto. Ganymede, which is the largest moon of Jupiter, is actually in front of Jupiter from our perspective. And we can't see it because the planet is reflecting so much light. It's kind of blocking out that, that view. We're also able to see some stars now. Yeah, look at that. It's, it's kind of pretty. Dark. Okay. Yes. Now bring the exposure down and the gain down so that we can see the planets themselves a bit better. A bit better of Saturn here. There we go. 
It's not bad. Yeah, those rings are so pretty. Can we zoom in on them yeah, a little we'll bit more? In, we'll zoom in on those. So the distance between these two planets, I know when we zoom in, it looks like there's quite a bit of distance, but it is 0.1 of a degree. Um, horizon to horizon, of course, is 180 degrees. So this is 0.1 of a degree. So they are quite close. And this is, whoa, yep, you moved, didn't sorry, you, Chris? <laughs> you can see how our view of Saturn seems to be shaking a lot. Um, what is the exposure time? Uh, 132 milliseconds. Okay. So uh, I should say the frame rate here is mostly because the, the, the slow frame rate here is mostly because of the length of time it takes for this entire uh, CMOS to read out, transfer over the USB and onto our laptop. Um, if I were to focus in on just that one place, it would actually update a lot more uh, with these short exposures. But that is a pretty good looking view of Saturn. And I know some of you are like, no, it's not. I've seen the Hubble Space Telescope images and those are spectacular. Um, Hubble Space Telescope images are great. Also, we've had a number of spacecraft that have either gone to Saturn and orbited Saturn. The Cassini spacecraft is uh, the one that springs to mind. It was out there orbiting Saturn for years, seven years, I believe. It was obviously much closer to the planet and had a much better view of the planet. Oops. Um, we are really far away. Um, it is approximately 10 AU from the sun. So an AU is an astronomical unit. It would be trillions of miles or kilometers. Um, 10 AU, hang on. No, it'd be only billions. So one AU is the distance um, from the Earth to the Sun, the average distance from the Earth to the Sun. And astronomers use that kind of as a standard. And that is 93 million miles or 149 million kilometers. So at 10 AU, Saturn is 149 million times 10 is 1.49 billion kilometers away. Um, but 10 AU is just easier to say. So at that distance, the fact that we have the ability to image the rings at all is uh, is pretty astounding. And this C8 that we have, it is a very, very nice um, telescope. It is one of the college's telescopes. So I am a professor of astronomy at Glendale Community College, and this is one of the college telescopes. Good and question. it is... Um, I'm just explaining about the telescopes. Sorry. Probably a couple of thousand dollars. I mean, they're not cheap. Um, I think they're possibly about $1,500 now. Um, but you get more bells and whistles with it, just like you can get more bells and whistles with anything. But it is a really good telescope that you can buy kind of off the rack, if you would, off the shelf. Um, and then the actual camera that we're using is less than $1,000 US. So this whole rig put together, um, I think you could easily do for $3,000 US. Should you be so inclined? So there was right. a question as to, is Earth the only, I guess, thing in the solar system that has an atmosphere that protects it from impacts, like asteroids? Well, I won't say Earth's atmosphere actually protects as much from impacts. There are smaller um, bits of space rock that actually can burn up in the atmosphere as they come through, and that results in meteors or meteor showers. Um, you may have heard of them as falling stars or shooting stars, but they're not stars at all. Of course, they're little bits of spaced up, space dust or space rock burning up as they come through. And when I say little bits, about the size of a grain of rice or a grain of sand, um, larger ones generally make it and impact the earth. So something about the size of your thumb or the size of your fist would easily make it through the earth's atmosphere. So earth's atmosphere, not particularly helpful in helping avoid impacts. Um, luckily, the solar system is, um, it, I would call it a little bit dusty because we get meteors all the time, like Chris and I saw one earlier this evening and it was quite bright, but it's um, pretty empty compared to the first billion, billion and a half years of the solar system. Um, the solar system is now just over four and a half billion years old. Um, so the sun and all the planets formed 
approximately 4.65 billion years ago. This is what science tells us. And the first billion, billion and a half, it was pretty, uh, pretty chaotic place. There were lots of what were called planetesimals, which could be chunks of rock that would be 500 kilometers across or a thousand kilometers across. These were the size that would have left huge impacts like the ones that would have formed Mare on the moon. Probably those actually are more along the lines of 50 um, to 100 kilometers across. Uh, but there's evidence that the earth has had large impacts. And to be honest, I don't think our atmosphere is going to do anything to slow them down. Um, Venus does have a much thicker atmosphere than the earth does. But if you have a huge chunk of rock, the atmosphere of Venus may slow it down, but I think you'd still find that it would go through the atmosphere. Because the atmosphere, let's be honest, it's a gas. It's a dense gas, especially around Venus, but it is still gas and gases flow. You can push aside the molecules and the atoms of a gas if a solid is passing through. So, Okay, yeah. so I'm really fighting the telescope. I think we're going to move over to the 60 inch again. Let's do Mars. See. They're going to they're going to do Mars in the 16th, I think. Are they? Well, we eventually could, we could give them another we could, view. We could. Hey there. <laughs> Everybody can see Mars, right? So we've we've got Mars in the 16-inch telescope. Um, the view that you have is a live view. Uh, this, this is a, a really pretty good view of the, of Mars tonight. You can make out, uh, shadows and, uh, if you, we, we think we might be able to see a polar cap, just a little bright spot reflecting light where there's ice. Um, again, this is, this is a pretty good view of Mars. I think, um, if you, it's, it's, it's amazing to be able to see it live through a telescope. Uh, I've gotten a bit spoiled because I've gotten used to beautiful, uh, beautiful pictures taken by spacecraft orbiting Mars. You can actually go get really high resolution maps of the Martian surface anytime you want. Um, but this is the view of Mars live from Earth right now uh, through the 60 inch telescope. So uh, the great, the, just remember the telescope is letting you see what your eye can't right to your eye. Mars is just a, a really bright red star. So once we started pointing telescopes at things and you notice that some of them like this actually have uh, a shape, it's a big round thing with some dark splotches on it. That was pretty amazing. In fact, with, with, uh, with Mars um, for a while, people were really excited because they thought those dark splotches might be canals uh, and there could be life on, the people were, were thinking there might be all kinds of advanced civilizations on Mars. Of course, we know that's not the case now, uh, but we're still looking for evidence of life on Mars. So there are, there's a spacecraft on its way to Mars right now, as well as other rovers that are still on the surface. Uh, and there's lots of evidence that water has flowed on Mars. Um, that's a good question. Is the North or South Pole of Mars closer to us? Um, yeah, we're gonna have to look it up. I'm gonna look it up for you. That's a good Mars question. Mars. I think it would also depend on where Mars is in its orbit and where we are in our orbit because Mars is also tilted on its axis almost the same amount uh, as Earth. So um, it, it would depend when and where we are both in our orbits. But that's a really good question. Uh, let's see. Oh, and... Uh, some, some, an interesting fact about Mars, Mars has two little moons, Phobos and Deimos. They're much, much smaller than the Earth's moon. Um, unlike the Earth's moon, which is very, very slowly over time moving away from the planet Earth, uh, Phobos and Deimos are doing the opposite. Uh, they will eventually, many, 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 many years from now, uh, deorbit. And in fact, they won't just deorbit, they'll be pulled apart by Mars gravity and Mars will have a very briefly uh, a brief, short-lived ring system. I think Phobos is about 60 million years from now. 60 million years from now. N not going to be as spectacular as Mars rings, but it's kind of crazy to think of Mars as having rings. Um, let's see. If a planet... planet um, so, 
that's someone was asking about that. Someone's asking about um, rings. So they're made up of rocks and ice. And would you have to worry about those bits of rocks and ice hitting a planet? Um, that's uh, not the case for for Mars. For Mars or Saturn, they slowly dissipate. But um, the 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 like I said, the interesting thing is the opposite is happening with the Moon. Very very slowly, it's moving further and further away from us, and it's actually slowing down. The Earth's orbit as it does. Uh, so the Earth used to spin much faster than it does now, uh, and the Moon used to be a bit closer. One and a half inches per year at the moment. One and a half inches per year. That's pretty fast. Yeah. Uh, so as I said, this is a beautiful view. If you, if you, again, if you have a clear sky and you can see the sky right now with just your eyes, uh, Mars is one of the brightest things in the sky. Um, it's, and it's, it's great because if you are able to see, uh, it has a distinct color, it's bright red. Um, there, are, there aren't too many objects in the sky where with just your eyes, you might be able to tell the difference in color, but Mars is really, really striking. Uh, and this time of year, because we're in the winter time, um, with just your eyes, you, can, you might also get to see uh, Orion, which has a bright red star. Um, so, uh, let's see. Before uh, before we go to, I want to I want to give folks a chance to look at Mars a little while longer. Um, but there are some other really exciting things we can see with this telescope while we have the time. We're not going to move yet. Um, but the the great thing about this telescope, the 60 inch, is it has a, a it's it's really good for looking at the at objects like globular clusters and planetary nebulae, really beautiful deep sky objects. Um, that are kind of hard to see with smaller telescopes. Uh, someone asked, why is Mars red? That's, that's a good question. It's uh, basically because it's very rusty. Um, it's, covered in, it's, uh, it's covered in a whole bunch of iron oxide, which is rust. It's the same thing that, um, same, reason, same reason rust is red on Earth, except in Mars' case, there's a lot more of it, and it's all over the place. Uh, and... Before we, uh, before we move on, I just wanted to uh, ask, I think we can still see the conjunction. Um, so if folks are, are, have gotten their fill of Mars, it might be fun to take a look at the conjunction again. Uh, and then over here at the 60 inch, we can find another object that might be interesting to look at. Uh, we're, we, we've got so many things in the sky to pick. Uh, we've tried to pick out a couple okay. of really cool looking targets for you. Uh, oh, someone asked if we can see the Pleiades. That's a good question. A little bit. The Pleiades is is so big on the sky; it's actually best to see with just your eyes or with a pair of binoculars. If we looked with the with this telescope, the sixty inch, it would be it would be only a tiny portion of the Pleiades. You wouldn't be able to see all of the stars. Okay, I'm going to mute myself since we have the conjunction again. Okay, I think I'm unmuted. All right, so here we are back at the conjunction. And you might be able to tell that I have to keep moving the telescope. Uh, and the reason for that is as we get closer to the horizon, it's having a harder time, I think, reaching over that far. I think all the cables are free. Okay, so let's see more questions. Can we see the Pleiades? Uh, probably, we could probably go have a look at that. Uh, I should mention that even though we're using a small telescope, the field of view of our camera, oh, now now who's shaking the camera? I'm sorry, I think All Jeff right. already answered that question. Oh, he already, okay, sorry. <laughs> I wasn't paying attention. Uh, let's Can we see. Still see. Oh, we can't still see the conjunction. It's really in the murk of the horizon. It's not doing too bad. Very I mean, if you look, close. if you look at Saturn, it's, it's actually not doing too badly. Let me uh, let me go to the controls and zoom in there. Yeah, Saturn is looking good. So this this is really it. I'm I'm really looking forward to the other objects we're going to see tonight because it looks like the seeing tonight is really is stabilizing. Superb. Because this is what are we at? What ten degrees maybe? Usually you if wouldn't. That yeah, if, if we were doing this on a regular night, I would I would expect to see just a blob here. I would not expect to see the gap between the ring and the planet. Uh, and maybe you can also, again, see how the upper right of the planet is kind of red and the lower left is kind of blue. 
Again, that's uh, because the atmosphere is acting like a prism. Altitude is seven degrees. Seven degrees. Okay, so we are... Seven degrees above the horizon. That's Jupiter. So Saturn will be ever so slightly yeah. higher. All right, let's go. Let's go look at Jupiter again. See how the bands look for that if the seeing is so good. Uh, we did check, and I was hoping that we would have time for um, which one is it? Callisto? That's in front. Or Ganymede? Ganymede was right. Ganymede. Then. We were hoping Ganymede would come back out again, but that doesn't happen until the planet sets. So, well, at less than seven degrees above the horizon, it's going to set pretty quick. Okay. So that's yeah, so for those of you who saw this before when we zoomed in and had a look at the surface features, you can probably tell it's a lot worse than it was before. And again, that's just because when you look close to the horizon, you're just looking through just more of that atmosphere, more of that turbulence. And so the, the image just isn't as crisp and clean. Now I'm going to pop back over to Zoom to see if there's any questions going on. Uh, let's see. Do planets push pull away from each other? That's why there's always the gap. Uh, like Earth, north, south magnetic field. OK, there's a few things in there. Um, Planets do always pull on each other. The sun pulls on the planets. Everything pulls on everything else. That's how gravity works. There is no pushing from regular stuff like planets, galaxies, stars, all those things. They simply pull on things. And that's what causes things to go into orbits. There is this stuff out there called dark energy you've probably heard of, um, which is our best guess for why we think the universe is currently accelerating in its expansion. And that is kind of like a gravitational push. The dark energy is basically pushing on everything everywhere at the same way. And so things are flying apart faster and faster and faster over time. I'm losing the planet. I'm going to recenter here. Are you able to read the, question, the questions that are coming up? Someone asked about the moons. Can we image the moons of Saturn? Image the moon of Saturn. Okay. So I've we'll got do our best. the view here. So Titan's over on that side, but I didn't see anything for Saturn. Over towards where Jupiter is? So, no, the other way. Oh, the other way. So away from Jupiter? Yeah. All right, let's go over that way and we will pump up the gain and pump up the exposure and see what happens. So I'm trying to orient my. So Titan would be on the other side of Saturn from Jupiter. Oh, there it is. I think that little dot. This this one over here? Yes. That one. No, this one over here. Oh, this one. Oh, that, that close. That one. Okay. Yeah. So it's pretty close. They can see your arrow, apparently. So take your yeah. arrow over. Oh, by the way, if you guys want to see atmospheric refraction in action, here it is. I can see this very clearly. You may not see it with the video compression, but I see very clearly blue at one end and... Oops, <laughs> a little bit of turbulence there. Uh, and kind of red at the other end. We're getting almost a little bit of what's called spectroscopy going on here. So this is actually showing us the spectrum of this moon. Uh, and again, it's just, we're going lower. So we're seeing more atmosphere. It's acting more and more like a prism. Uh, so that allows us to see Titan. Let me try and bring the exposure way up and just, yeah. You can see they're all looking like little prisms. Uh, all like little rainbows. And that's atmospheric refraction in action. All right, we'll go back. So that dot beside Saturn. Um, oh, did you want to talk about that? Yeah, okay. that's Titan. And then the other one. So this is Titan. That's Titan. And the one on the other side. Down here. Hang on. I need my app for this. Um, Titan is there and it's probably well there's Rhea and my and Mimus. I would say it's Rhea because Rhea, Rhea is here. actually quite a lot bigger. Rhea is interesting if I remember correctly. Rhea has its own little ring system. Does it? It does. I didn't Iapetus know that. is the is the the white the, the light and the dark. Mimus Enceladus fused stuff, but I believe Rhea has its own little ring system. 
I mean, not obviously as beautiful as Saturn's, but okay. yeah, okay. So then the, there was another question of if and when Jupiter is going to lose its storm. Oh, right, red. yeah, it's been getting smaller over the years. It was certainly around in the time of Newton. They could see it back then. Galileo saw it. Oh, I'm sorry, I meant Galileo. So Newton definitely saw it. De yeah. <laughs> it's it's been known as the great red spot. It is getting less great and less red. So it is shrinking and fading. I don't think it's time... visible tonight, is it? I did not see it. It's probably on the other side of the planet because the planet does rotate. Just like the Earth rotates, both Jupiter and Saturn rotate. Um, Jupiter has the fastest rotation of all. I think it's just shy of 10 hours, nine hours and 56 it's less minutes. Less than half a day, yeah. Yeah, nine hours and 56 minutes for one day of Jupiter. When school kids come to the planetarium, I tell them their school day would be about three hours long. They love that. Um, Saturn is a little bit a little uh, longer, but yeah. I, wow, they are so low. From, our, per, from our perspective, Jupiter is looking very red at the moment. Okay, let's, uh, oh, and I can hear the dome rotating in the distance. <laughs> it's time to go back over the 16th. Uh, might not be quite the time yet. If they're still rotating the dome, they haven't reached their position yet. So let's let's go back to a view of the oh, no not that let's go back to a view of the moons of Jupiter. So I'll try and oh okay we're at the bottom of the so I need to go this way or this way. Oops, oh, zoom out. Okay. Yeah, I can't see anything right now. And I need to go this way, I think. Yeah. So I'll bring the cane up. Is Hubble capturing the conjunction? Is Hubble no. capturing the conjunction? That's a no idea. good question. I I doubt they have a, let's see. I don't know if they'd be able to catch, get both on the same instrument. That would be my guess. None of the, none of the cameras on the Hubble right. Space Telescope have a wide enough field of view to view both at the same time, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, let me zoom in on this moon so you can really see this. Oh, wow. So one thing we do as astronomers, uh, we take images of the night sky, kind of like what we're doing right now. But another way for us to get information out of astronomical objects is to pass the light through a prism or another kind of element that spreads the light out into its component colors. Oops, it's getting away from me. Ah. And, oh, okay, come back, come back there. And uh, so if we were able to do this a little bit more, we could spread this image of the moon further out. We could see more, how much light is it giving off in the blue? How much is it giving off in the green? How much is it giving off in the red? And we can often find what are called spectral features, places where some of those colors are conspicuously missing. Um, and those are essentially stolen by different elements in either the atmosphere of the object, uh, or it could be some gas around it. Uh, it could be shining through some, some sort of gas, and that gas is stealing away these, uh, these photons, is this light at those particular colors. And each element has its own fingerprint. So by looking at the patterns of these, we can tell what things are made out of. Uh, this is how we discovered that the sun is made of hydrogen. Cecilia Payne made that observation a long time ago. Um, and one of the objects we're going to be looking at, I think it's the next one, the blue snowball, uh, is a nebula and it gives out light instead of stealing away. So instead of seeing a rainbow with colors missing, you would see no rainbow and just that particular color of light, which I think we'll see very clearly uh, when we move to that object. And for a while, they didn't know what this stuff was and they called it neb 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 nebulum. Nebulium or something like that, kind of like helium. All right, so are they ready for us to switch over? Yep. 
Yep. Okay. So we'll send you off to the 60 inch. So you might hear the dome. It's very loud. It's 112 years old. And you'll see the telescope slowly lowering to where it can view the object. So now that the dome is in position, you might be able to hear me again. Uh, the telescope is being lined up with the target. So when astronomers um, use a telescope like this one, we find, uh, we, we have to look up the coordinates of the target we want to look at. The sky is divided up into right ascension and declination, which is just like longitude and latitude on earth. Uh, and all the targets we know about have coordinates and you can go look them up and then this, this telescope has a computer and encoders that knows where it's pointed and allows us to uh, know where we're pointing. Otherwise, you'd, you'd have to dead reckon around the sky. Now, the next step is going to be, we have a camera and the target that we're looking at is called the Blue Snowball. It's a planetary nebula. Uh, and I'm going to let... Yeah. And, there's two things we have to do. First, we're going to have to turn the lights off so it's going to get dark. And I'm going to switch to the view that the camera can see so that you all can see what we're looking at. There we go. And because this, uh, this digital camera, you can adjust the exposure time and the gain uh, as, as they've been doing with the conjunction. The blue snowball is a planetary nebula. It's much fainter. You definitely need a powerful telescope to see it. Luckily, we have one here. Uh, so what you're seeing, uh, uh oh, did we lose it? So the, the blue snowball is a planetary nebula. A planetary nebula is what's left after a star like the sun reaches the end of its life cycle. Um, a star, uh, our sun is going to chug along happily for billions of years, but eventually it's going to run out of fuel. The hydrogen that's fusing to helium in its core uh, is basically going to dry up. It's going to go through a few other stages of evolution. It's actually going to fuse helium. It's going to fuse helium and hydrogen and in the core and in shells. Uh, without going into too much details, at the very end of its life, the sun will stop fusing uh, elements in its core and it will start to collapse and shed off all its outer layers. All those outer layers form a, a cloud of gas, a nebula. And at the end, the sun, as it's, as it's, as it's contracting, uh, eventually uh, gravity will push up against a physical limit where all of the electrons and all of the atoms uh, in the star are pushing back against gravity and hold it up. And then you have what's called a white dwarf. And it, white dwarfs shine very bright and very hot for a while, not as long as the sun. Unfortunately, they cool off slowly. And once they start shining, uh, that light lights up all of the, ga uh, lights up all of the gas around it. Uh, so what you see when you look at a planetary nebula like this one is you'll see this ring of gas and kind of a fuzzy cloud. This one is called the blue snowball because it has a bluish color. I'm going to increase the exposure time to see if we can see it a little better. Uh, and in the middle, you can see a little star. That's the white dwarf that's lighting up the nebula around it. Uh, and there are a couple of other stars in the field of view. So there are some other stars that have nothing to do with this one. Uh, but the, the nebula itself is what you're seeing there. And this is something that's, uh, it looks quite beautiful through the 60 inch telescope. You really need a big mirror uh, and, and, a, and a, a dark sky to be able to see something like this. Um, so uh, 
someone's asking if you can visit Mount Wilson yourself. Uh, and right now, uh, because, because of the current situation, unfortunately, you can't visit right now. But in the future, Mount Wilson, uh, as it has been in the past, is open to the public. Um, there, it's uh, typically in, in uh, everyday times, it's open during the day. Uh, and you can go to mountwilson.edu to find out about other events and tours that you can take in the future. Um, right now we're coming to you virtually, of course. Uh, and in the future, uh, you can actually reserve the telescope to look through with your own eye. Uh, if you're interested, like I said, check out mountwilson.edu to find out more. So uh, one thing I just wanted to clarify, we're looking at a planetary nebula. Unfortunately, uh, astronomers sometimes use names that are really confusing. And planetary nebula has nothing to do with planets, really. Uh, it, it's it's, a, it's a, a sort of a goof of history that we've hung on to this name. We're really looking at just a cloud of gas that's left over after a star has reached the end of its life. Um, so let's see. Oh, and uh, I wanted to mention that, like I said, this this is the end of a star like the sun's lifetime. The sun is about 5 billion years old, uh, and it's going to keep shining pretty much as it is now for about another 5 billion years. How long a star will shine like that depends on how massive it is. Stars that are more massive than the sun, they, they burn out much faster. They live for maybe, uh, well, the brightest stars only live for a few millions of years. The very, faint, uh, the very faintest, smallest stars actually can live for many billions and billions of years. Uh, and the interesting thing is that what happens to a star at the end of its life depends on how massive it is. So the most massive stars, uh, stars that are you know 10 times the mass of the sun, 50 times the mass of the sun, 100 times the mass of the sun, uh, those stars, they shine incredibly brightly and burn out incredibly quickly. Even though they have a lot more fuel, they shine so brightly that they use it up in, like I said, you know, maybe 10 million, tens of millions of years. And they, and they end their stellar lives more, much more spectacularly. They tend to uh, explode as a supernova as the mass of the star is so strong that it overcomes uh, the gravity as it's collapsing overcomes all of those other forces that try to push back against gravity, like with a which is the case in a smaller star with the sun, where you don't have that supernova explosion at the end. Um, so I hear that we're about to lose the conjunction. Uh, so uh, we're going to let you go back and see it one more time, and we're going to point the 60 inch at another target uh, while you're looking at the conjunction. And uh, we'll be back with you soon, if we're ready. OK, well, you're about to go behind the trees. So this is our last chance to have a look. So let me zoom out. And you can probably tell they're getting dim. And that's because we're actually looking through the trees, believe it or not. Uh, they're blocking some, well, yeah. <laughs> Let me pump up the gain, let's see. Oh, I think- We lost Jupiter behind the trees. I think we're, well, we might get a gap. Hold on, it might come back in a second. They are so low. I think they're about three degrees now. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever gone this far. I've never been this, this close to the horizon. Okay, let's put up the exposure time. The nice thing about being up on okay. the catwalk is that we are so elevated, we're right at the treetops. Yeah. So I can kind of... So what we're going to be seeing now is as the telescope tracks downwards, we're going to lose the planets as the branches of the tree block the light, and then we'll gain them back again. And this is very similar to when uh, we astronomers are looking through gaps in the clouds. We kind of just hope that uh, every now and then we'll get a little bit of a, a little bit of a gap and be able to see things. Uh, okay, let's bring, let's see if we can bring the moons back. Uh, wow, <laughs> look how look how elongated they uh, are. Yeah, the atmosphere is major distortion here.
But for those of you who have cloudy skies at your particular location, I will let you know that it is crystal clear here in Southern California atop Mount Wilson. The sky is beautiful. I'm looking to the west and there's the summer triangle, the bright stars of Vega and Deneb and Altair. We've got the first quarter moon up there, not far from Mars. It is a stunning night here, even though the, the, the two planets, um, Jupiter and Saturn, are just heading out of our view. There's a lot more to see here, and it's, it's just a lovely night to observe. I know many people are coming in from the north, and it's particularly cold, but we've got the Santa Ana winds blowing here, and it is, I think, a balmy 50 degrees Fahrenheit. It's about 10 degrees Celsius. So I'm not even wearing a hat. Yeah, it's a beautiful night. Beautiful night. All right, beautiful so planets. I will, I think I'll leave it kind of like that so we can see both planets. I can't even see them anymore. Yeah. With my eyes. Oh, no, we're seriously between. <laughs> it's a, a very, yeah, the trees. it's I'm a right. very spindly tree. Yeah, it's a pine. And I'm right, I'm looking right along the uh, tube of the telescope and I can see Jupiter, but yeah. Now, uh, did we ever talk about how far apart these things are? Um, we did the angular distance, Just, okay. one so, of a degree, but the physical distance, no, I don't think you've mentioned that. All right, so even though these guys look like they're close to each other on the sky, uh, as we talked about earlier, you, you have to imagine that these planets are on their own orbits. And Jupiter is much closer to us than Saturn is. So let me give you the numbers. Uh, Jupiter currently is 5.9 astronomical units away. And what that means is it's 5.9 times farther away than the Earth is from the sun. So we use the Earth-Sun distance as a convenient yardstick. And I think we're going behind a tree branch. <laughs> well, that's interesting. So it's, co it's covering up Jupiter, but Saturn's still there. Wow. Oh, yeah, sorry, right. Uh, okay, so 5.9 astronomical units, which is 887 million kilometers or 49 light minutes. And in fact, I think 49 light minutes is probably about the best uh, unit to use. So it takes light 49 minutes to get from that small, tiny <laughs> blur of Jupiter to you. Saturn, on the other hand, is 90 light minutes away. So it's almost twice as far away. And now I think they're, I think they might be gone. Uh, and so in between them, uh, between the two planets, uh, you're looking at a distance of 41 light minutes or 710 million kilometers. So even though they look close together on the sky, they're actually quite far apart. They're a sol almost a solar system, like many, many times the distance from us to the sun away uh, from them. Uh, so Saturn is basically twice the distance that Jupiter is. Yeah, pretty much. Yep, and since we've lost our lovely planets, I think we should head back to the 60-inch dome for the remainder of the evening. Yeah, there's not a whole lot left to look at here, guys. So we're <laughs> going to sign off and, oh, what was that? Yeah, whatever. Okay. And enjoy the view from the 60-inch. Yeah, good night. So here we are at the 60-inch. Uh, you might wonder what you're looking at. Uh, you're looking at the Andromeda Galaxy, M31. So uh, one thing that's great about having a digital camera is that you can change the exposure time. So when you look at the Andromeda galaxy, uh, if, if uh, what you see first is you might see a little fuzzy blob right in the middle. That's actually the very center of a galaxy that's full of billions of stars. So we've gone from looking at uh, objects right in our own backyard, uh, our solar system that are only a few hundred million miles away. Uh, we looked at, uh, we looked at a planetary nebula, which is quite distant. So the blue snowball, the target we were looking at before, it's a few thousand light years away. Uh, but now we've, we've taken it a step further. So the Andromeda galaxy is a couple of million light years away. We're looking at a galaxy outside of our own. Um, and the, the, the cool thing is this is a really important target in lots of different ways. Um, it's it's the nearest big galaxy to our own. It's um it's like a big brother to the Milky Way. Uh, it's on a collision course with the Milky Way. So in a few billion years, 
the Milky Way and Andromeda are going to make one really big galaxy. And the, the Andromeda galaxy uh, is important in the history of Mount Wilson and the Carnegie Observatory. So uh, originally when folks looked at this in a telescope, um, people didn't really know what it was. They saw a fuzzy blob, maybe a bunch of, they, maybe the, 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 they actually called them, you know, spiral nebula. You might be able to work out features, but they didn't know if it was just a nebula in our own galaxy, in our backyard, or if it was actually uh, uh, its own system of stars many millions of light years away. Uh, and research that was done with the 60 inch telescope, the one that we're looking through right now, and the 100 inch telescope, the telescope that, uh, that Chris and Jenny were at, proved that uh, first that um, the Milky Way is about 100,000 light years across. An astronomer named Harlow Shapley established that with the 60 inch telescope. Uh, and then Edwin Hubble using the 100 inch telescope to observe uh, variable stars in the Andromeda galaxy figured out that this, this fuzzy nebula that we're looking at is actually a galaxy all on its own millions of light years away. Um, so we really discovered our place in the universe here at Mount Wilson. Um, and you're getting a chance to see it live right now. Uh, and a lot of people were asking about sort of uh, questions that have to do with the atmosphere and looking at the sky from Earth. So some of the most beautiful images of the Andromeda galaxy can be taken from Earth. Uh, there's also an amazing map of most of the Andromeda galaxy with uh, taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, if you're up in space on the International Space Station or floating around uh, with, the, you don't look through the Hubble Space Telescope, if you're taking a picture with the Hubble Space Telescope, you don't have the atmosphere in the way. Um, there's, there's no air in between you and space. And the atmosphere causes astronomers a lot of problems because uh, the wiggliness of the atmosphere can degrade your images. Uh, there's lots of ways that we try to uh, fight that by building telescopes on mountains and uh, making really, really precise and unique optics that can account for the wobbling in the atmosphere. But in space, you can see things much clearer. One of the ways that you can see that with the naked eye is uh, if you go outside at night and you see stars twinkling, if they appear to be changing in brightness or changing color, um, which somebody asked about, that twinkling is because of the wiggling atmosphere. Uh, the air between you and space is is uh, actually wobbling the image around and maybe slightly changing the color, maybe smearing out the, the thing you're looking at. Um, and one trick, if you wanna know the star that you're looking at, whether it's a planet or a star, so if you're looking at Mars tonight, if you're lucky enough to see it, um, it's, uh, it's interesting because planets don't twinkle. Um, they're, they're big enough that the image doesn't jump around as much to your eye. Um, again, this, this uh, to me, looking at this is really spectacular, even though it's not as, uh, maybe not as beautiful as some of the uh, spiral galaxy images you've seen taken with other really, you know, big telescopes at a dark place. You're looking at billions of stars right now, live with your, with your eyes. 100 billion, <laughs> yeah. Um, and someone asked, ooh, someone asked about the area where the Milky Way's black hole is located. That's a good question. So this, uh, as far as we know, most galaxies have supermassive black holes at their centers, including the Milky Way galaxy. Um, the, the Andromeda would have one at its core too. The Milky Way galaxy, the, where the black hole is located, is way down in the disk. So it's pretty hard to see from, uh, it's pretty hard to see through all the dust uh, uh, and stuff in the way. And it's, it's much easier to see from the Southern hemisphere uh, and a different time of year. One thing that astronomers have to contend with is um, where you are on the earth limits what you can see in the night sky. For those of us in the Northern hemisphere, we have a different view than folks in the Southern hemisphere, which is why we like to build telescopes in the Northern and Southern hemisphere. The Carnegie Observatory's modern telescopes are actually located in Chile at Las Campanas Observatory. Um, so uh, do we wanna take a look at M32? Yeah, we're gonna go ahead and rotate down. We might actually get both of them. I don't want to do that. We're, we're going to try to take a look at M31's companion galaxy. Uh, M31 has a, a Andromeda galaxy, has a little friend, uh, M32. Uh, the M's, the names that we're throwing around, are the Messier catalog. Uh, Charles Messier was an astronomer uh, 
what century? The 18th century, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was it 1700s France. 1700s France, who he was really interested in comets. He wanted to find comets, which are fuzzy things on the sky. So he made a catalog of any fuzzy thing that's not a comet. And astronomers uh, both, uh, uh, astronomers use that catalog still to keep track of, uh, to keep track of objects on the sky. So objects like the Andromeda galaxy often have many names, like M31 is its de designation in the Messier catalog, but there are lots and lots of catalogs. So uh, what you're seeing right now is we're actually moving the telescope around and trying to find another view. Uh, and so you might see a few faint stars. And what we're looking for, as I said, is M32. Oops. And someone asked, oh, how far away is the Andromeda galaxy? The Andromeda galaxy is about two and a half million light years or so. Uh, so not terribly far. It's right in our backyard. Oops. OK, sorry. Hey. And uh, it looks like we have a smeared out image. OK, so we're waiting. Because it's a digital camera and we're taking a long exposure, we have to wait a, wait a moment for it to read out. There we go. That's M32. So M32 is at, it's, uh, it's at the same distance as M31. Uh, it's a satellite galaxy of M31. It's not quite as big. Uh, I can tell you how many stars it has in one moment. <laughs> I don't know that up. Do you happen to know, Tim? No, but it can't be more than 1% the mass yeah. of So the, 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 the cool thing is that um, most galaxies actually have smaller galaxies around them. The Milky Way has uh, companion galaxies called the Magellanic Clouds. We can't see them here in the Northern Hemisphere, but you can see them in the Southern Hemisphere. They're actually dwarf galaxies that are slowly being um, pulled apart and eaten up by the Milky Way. Uh, okay, let's see. And oh, someone asked about online courses to learn more about the solar system and astronomy. That's a really good question. Um, there, there are loads of great resources uh, that NASA has put out. I know there are some folks, um, uh, there are some folks on YouTube. Phil Plate, who's a, a popular astronomer, has a series of videos and a blog where he updates on, on uh, ongoing events. Um, there's, there's just so many resources on the internet now, it's really easy uh, to look things up. So even uh, when someone asks me how many stars are in M32 and I can't remember, I can just go to Google. Um, but the, that's right, glendale.edu for astro classes. And the, the, the other thing is, um, is that uh, M32, because, because the 60 inch telescope is looking at a small piece of the sky, you can't see this beautiful huge view of both M31 and M32 at the same time. Uh, Andromeda M31 is so big that it's uh, you know, more than the size of the full moon on the sky. Um, it's much, much fainter. You can see it with just your naked eye if you're in a very dark sky, um, it's somewhere in the Northern hemisphere. It looks like a faint fuzzy blob, but it is possible to see something millions of light years away with just your eye. Uh, where, we, where we live uh, in the Los Angeles area, it's nearly impossible though. You have to go somewhere very dark to see it. Uh, someone asked about uh, what can we learn from dwarf galaxies and what, is it, uh, what does eating the other dwarf galaxies mean? Um, so what's interesting is a galaxy like the Milky Way or Andromeda has hundreds of billions of stars and they're built up over a very long period of time uh, they can, uh, the Milky Way is making its own stars out of dust and gas. Um, but over time, galaxies can actually merge with each other. I mentioned the Andromeda galaxy is going to merge with the Milky Way in about 5 billion years or so. Uh, that means that when that happens, the gravitational forces between the two galaxies is going to yank them around and cause them to make a bunch of stars really quickly. And then you'll end up with one really big galaxy that is twice, well, it's the, si the mass of the Milky Way and Andromeda combined. And you'll have a brand new galaxy that you'll have to call something else like Milkomeda. 
Uh, the other thing that can happen is if a very much smaller galaxy um, is, mm, is uh, pulled in by a, a much larger galaxy like the Milky Way and the Magellanic Clouds or a dwarf galaxy, if, everything's, if everything lines up just right and uh, they come together, then the small galaxy doesn't really disturb the bigger galaxy much, but the bigger galaxy will, um, through gravity and tidal forces, will slowly pull the smaller galaxy apart and actually absorb all of the stars from the smaller galaxy over a very long period of time. We see this uh, in the Milky Way because there are all these streams, they're called tidal streams, of stars that we think are the remnants of dwarf galaxies that were uh, dwarf galaxies that were actually absorbed by the Milky Way. Someone asked, what's the farthest object you can see with the 60 inch? That's a really good question. It's a question we get a lot about big telescopes like the 100 or 60 inch. It depends on how bright it is. There are quasars, the, the brightest objects in the universe that are billions of light years away that are so bright, you can see them with a telescope like the 100 inch. And then there are planets right in our own backyard, sorry, asteroids or comets that are so faint, they're really hard to see even with a big telescope. Uh, I think we're almost out of time, right? So I don't wanna miss the chance to say goodbye, but we've gotten so many good questions tonight. I'm really sorry we couldn't get to all of them. So we're hoping to have future events. We can keep answering your questions. Okay. We all here now? I think so. Let's see. Hold on. So it looks like yeah, you should turn your light on. Turn the light on in the, in the, in the dome. Just so we can see you and say goodbye. Breaking. There we go. Yay. For those of you who have expressed an interest in more of these live streamed virtual star parties, um, Mount Wilson is teaming with Glendale Community College and starting in January, we will have virtual field trips for school groups that will actually be open to the public. They will be in the evening for obvious reasons, um, but you can stay tuned on the Mount Wilson um, website page and their Facebook page for more information on those virtual star parties that we are hoping, weather permitting, will be once per week. Well, I think that's it. We're done. <laughs> We're going to clean up and head back down off the mountain. But I hope you all uh, had a good time. It would have been really nice to have you up here all, I don't know how many thousand of you. But I guess that's one of the good things about this is we can have a lot of people all together at once uh, if we can't be here together in person. We're really glad that we could have you here. And it was really fun to do. Thanks for watching. All right. And we're going to say thank you to our moderators who were trying to get our attention the whole time and give us questions to answer, but it was really tough. We'll try to do better on that in the future. Uh, okay. Thank you very much for joining us this evening for the conjunction, great conjunction of 2020. <laughs>